Okay, Todd, shall we get going? Yep, that sounds good. Awesome. Well, so Todd and I are here today representing the collaboration between ProLiteracy and the EdTech Center at World Ed. Um, our two organizations have come together because we think that through this collaboration, we can make sure we get the most innovative and useful ideas out to the broadest range of practitioners possible. So I am Jen Vanek, Director of Digital Learning and Research at the EdTech Center at World Ed. I'm joined here by, by two of my colleagues, Victoria Neff and Ebony Vandross. And um, Todd, please welcome your, welcome your, your proliteracy side. Absolutely. I'm Todd Evans, Director of Professional Development, and I'm joined with uh, uh, Patty Celadon, who's also part of our professional development team. And uh, we'll be handling the questions at the end of the uh, webinar. That's great. Thanks. Uh, so now we'll turn it over to Ebony Vandross, who will give you a quick rundown of the engagement features of this webinar. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. For those of you that are unfamiliar with Zoom, you can find the control panel at the bottom of your Zoom screen. To access chat, click on the chat icon in that control panel and please make sure to select all panelists and attendees when you make comments so that your comments can be seen by everyone and not just the hosts. To use the hand raise feature, you can click on that icon in the um, control panel at the bottom of the screen and we ask that you use that if you have any technical issues and I don't see your question or comment in the chat. Uh, if you have any other questions, please email me at the email address in the fourth box and I'll put that in the chat as well. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ebony. So just a quick uh, little reminder. These are the, um, at the end of the webinar, you're going to receive an email from Proliteracy and Todd, which will have a recording. It'll have a list of the websites, resources, and other key learning points from this webinar. Where you're also going to get a copy of, of the slide and a transcript of the the um, questions and answers, and you're going to be able to get a certificate um, for your the time that you have spent here. So today our agenda includes a lightning talk um, titled Virtual Video English Reaching Students Through YouTube um, at Literacy Pittsburgh. So we are so pleased to have these three practitioners here from um, Literacy Pittsburgh who are going to be able to share some really great strategies for actually making videos, not just finding somebody else's videos, but actually give you some skills to, to do that on your own. We are calling this a lightning talk it, it, because it is not an extended you know, workshop where you're going to be doing your own hands-on stuff. So I, I like to think of these lightning talks as a springboard for your own exploration and learning, um, you know, started by the presentation and then extended through the facilitation of question and answers um, that, that come after the presentation, which pot Patty and Todd will lead. So we just want to point out to you that we try to have these webinars every fourth Friday. The, 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 the Proliteracy and the EdTech Center collaborate together on to bring these to you. Each organization has other webinars that they're running too, so do check out each of our sites um, for that information. Um, one extra note is that because the next two months, the fourth Fridays are on holidays, we've decided to have one webinar on December 4th at 1 Eastern, where instead of the two um, that fall on Thanksgiving and the, the um, Christmas holiday. So without further ado, I- Jen, actually, can I just yeah. remind people that when they are, um, Post, they can use the chat to like uh, introduce themselves and things like that. But when you have uh, questions for the presenters to pre please use the Q&A feature because it helps us track which questions we've uh, been able to answer for everyone. Great, thank you, super important point. Okay, so at this point now, we are gonna turn the presentation over to our guest presenters. We have Nicole Manino Johnson, Sarah Cole and Caitlin Griffiths, all from Literacy Pittsburgh. Welcome to Nicole, Sarah, and Caitlin. And I believe one of you is going to start sharing, correct? Yes, um, I will share.
Okay, uh, my name is Nicole Menino Johnson. I am an instructor of workplace ESL and citizenship at Literacy Pittsburgh. Our presentation is called Viral Video English, Reaching Students Through YouTube at Literacy Pittsburgh. Our mission at Literacy Pittsburgh is better lives through learning. Our vision is a more inclusive and productive community driven by access to education. We provide services throughout Pennsylvania in Allegheny County and Beaver County. We have free programs in nine areas, adult reading, writing, and math skills, high school equivalency prep, career transitions, which includes resume prep, interviewing skills, and uh, career options and post-secondary prep. We have workplace literacy where we offer on-site, typically ESL classes at local businesses. Um, we've had businesses at UPMC, which is a large healthcare provider in the area, um, Rivers Casino, the Weston Hotel, downtown Pittsburgh, and a local grocery store, Giant Eagle. We offer immigrant support services like heating assistance, childcare, and referrals to any kind of social services that our students may need. We have a family literacy program for both parents and children, which includes adult literacy, early childhood education, parenting skills, and intergeneration, intergenerational literacy activities. We have OASIS intergenerational tutoring, which is offered in six local school districts for children in K through fourth grade, which are paired with volunteers aged 50 or older for one-on-one -on -one tutoring throughout the school year. We have Compass AmeriCorps, which places and trains individuals for one year of service to provide full-time social services support and English language instruction at Literacy Pittsburgh and partnering organizations. Here's a few of our student demographics. 73% are from a minority group, 80% are between the ages of 25 and 59, 65% are English language learners, 65% female, 23% are employed full-time, and 49% self-report as low income. And our student demographics, we have students from over around 100 countries, including Bhutan, Afghanistan, Sudan, the Ukraine, Tunisia, South Korea, Colombia. Um, we have very diverse classes. And here's a few of our outcomes. Literacy Pittsburgh helps more than 5,100 people annually through our nine programs. Last year, we had more than 770 volunteers give 75,000 hours to help our students succeed. So for today's talk, we're talking about YouTube. And why did we choose YouTube? So first we have two YouTube channels, Literacy Pittsburgh English Class and Family Literacy Storytime. We chose YouTube because it is free, it's easy to access and easy to use. We noticed that there's a great familiarity with YouTube. People, including our students, go to YouTube for entertainment or educational purposes. It's very popular. No instruction is needed on how to use it. You can just share a link, students click on it, and the video plays. Um, we, we got started with it because of the pandemic, although I had always wanted to start a YouTube channel, there wasn't an urgent need to do so until the pandemic hit. Um, and we chose YouTube because we wanted our students to see our faces, hear our voices, and be able to continue with their studies to feel some semblance of normal. And I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to talk more about why YouTube. 
Uh, so as Nicole said, we thought this would work because it was something that was really familiar to a lot of our students. Um, and it was something that was of interest, but we maybe didn't have sort of the push we needed until um, the quarantine happened. But we're also hoping to accomplish a number of different things by using YouTube as well. Um, in particular, as we moved and shifted to having classes online during the quarantine, we realized that um, having these videos would actually be a really great way to free up additional time during our online classes to be able to do direct instruction within the YouTube videos so there would be more time in synchronous online classes to, um, to work with the students, excuse me, <clears throat> and have them interact with each other. Um, so almost sort of like if you attended the talk that was before this, it's almost kind of like a flipped learning approach where the direct instruction was happening within the videos and then the students have more time to kind of apply what they learned in the videos in class. Uh, in addition to this, it served as a study aid for a lot of students. So students were able to use this to practice or review what we did um, on their own time. And it gave access to instruction for students who maybe couldn't necessarily attend synchronous online Zoom classes as well. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Nicole to tell a little bit more why we chose YouTube and why we thought it would accomplish a lot of our, our needs. Okay, great. Actually, um, Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin, sorry. Yeah. No worries. Um, so for my portion, we did story times for family literacy and the majority of our family literacy students are ELL students, which is not typical to a lot of family literacy programs. So again, like Nicole said, we wanted to do something that we knew our students were comfortable with and most of our students we know did know how to use YouTube. So with our YouTube channel, we wanted to make sure that our families were still getting the comfort of our daily story time that we offered. And it also gave our parents a chance at a very small break, even if it was just five minutes, so that they were able to have just a little bit of me time, um, especially after all of our drastic changes when we shut down and all of our schools shutting down when our families weren't really prepared for that. Okay, go ahead, Nicole. Okay. So we'll talk a little about our video production. Um, so the first question was, what made us think we could do this? And I will turn it to Sarah. So I will freely admit that Nicole was a big part of what made me think, or the person who made me think I could initially do this. And maybe if there's one big takeaway from, um, from this discussion is that I think like a lot of our thinking around like, oh, a video, like that would be really challenging. Um, I hope maybe that folks take away from this that that's actually not the case. So Nicole at the very, uh, actually prior to our, our site being shut down, shot a video with one of our AmeriCorps members. And I had initially thought like, oh, this will take a lot of time. Will people use it? And when I had seen, I, had, I saw Nicole's video, I was really impressed with both how easy it seemed to actually be to actually put it together and how effective even a short video like that could be. Um, I'll turn it over to Caitlin to talk about what made Caitlin think that they could do it at the Family Literacy site. Thank you, Sarah. So at Family Literacy, um, I thought, okay, I see people doing this on YouTube all the time. I can do this. And I also had the benefit as I had recorded some classes beforehand to use as teaching tools to offer to our tutors for one-off classes that we offered in family literacy. And so I already had a good site to record for my computer. I had tons of books in my house because I have two small children. So I figured, why not? What could I lose? Maybe I got zero views, but no big deal. Nicole? Yeah. And what made me think we could do it? Um, I noticed that there's a lot of ESL instruction online already on YouTube. Our students use it and like it. And um, I just thought kind of like Caitlin did, I can do this too. Um, and we'll talk a little about equipment and space and software. So here's a picture of Sarah's setup and I'll let her speak about this. 
It's a little funny because I'm literally standing at this exact setup right now. So it feels a little strange and meta to be talking about it, but this is my particular setup um, at home. Prior to using this setup, so the first handful of videos that uh, Nicole, myself, and a couple other teachers used, we actually shot on site um, at Literacy Pittsburgh at our downtown center. And we used those, uh, we did those on a uh, cell phone, which was a little bit different. But now primarily what I'm using since I've been working from home, I have two computers. You can see the one on the left, I often open a program called Prezi, which I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. Um, but I use Prezi primarily to shoot most of my videos. And then on the right side, I have my second personal computer. I often use my personal computer to have scripts and notes and stuff open so I can quickly refer to that as I'm shooting. If you wanna to go to the next slide. Yeah, so primarily, like I said, I've been using Prezi since, um, since I've been working from home and shooting videos from home. You can kind of see in the picture, you'll have kind of a bar on the left-hand side and um, you can also add different backgrounds though I usually don't do that. Um, I usually upload a set of PowerPoint photos. So I'll have photos that I put into PowerPoint and with Prezi, you can actually upload a PowerPoint into it. And the way it sort of looks, and we'll see an example in the videos in just a little bit, um, you'll have a picture that kind of pops up on the right-hand side of you that you can scroll through and talk about the pictures within your video as you shoot them. Um, I think we're actually gonna take a moment right now too to look. So the first one says first day of shooting. So this is an example of one of the videos um, we shot prior to working from home. So I think Nicole, myself, and a couple other teachers, uh, oh my goodness, we spent a good number of hours shooting several videos back to back to back. So I'll let Nicole share that. Hi, Nicole, how are you calling? Because I feel very sick today and I can't work my shift. I'm sorry to hear that. When are you scheduled to work? I work from one o'clock to eight o'clock. Okay, no problem. I will find a different employee to cover for you. Sarah, did you wanna talk a little about the production of that video? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm just remembering, actually, I'm having sort of a flood of memories of that day, but for that particular set of videos, um, we were actually using a document projector to put a lot of the materials we were using um, there to do that. And then we were also using Nicole's cell phone um, to shoot as well. So we actually moved from doing that to when we were working from home. As you can see, I think Nicole's pulling up the next video. This is a later video. Um, it's related to a uh, reading that we had done with students about uh, polite and rude behavior at work. And this is me reviewing some vocabulary with Prezi. So the pictures you see on the right hand side are from a PowerPoint slide deck that I was able to incorporate from Prezi. And I'll, I'll let Nicole take it away. Listen and repeat. Fingernails. Fingernails. Deodorant. Deodorant. Yes, it is polite to have clean fingernails at work. It is polite to have clean fingernails at work. Thanks, Nicole. So again, as you can see, I was able to use pictures actually in the video. And I actually think that the production value you get from these Prezi videos is fairly high. And it's also pretty easy to use. So if you're comfortable using um, a slide deck of a PowerPoint in Zoom, I would say that it's just as easy to do that and record in Prezi.
And I'm gonna hand it over to Caitlin next to talk a little bit about both her setup and her process with making videos. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I think Nicole's gonna pull it up in just a second. There we go. So when I first started recording these story time videos, as you can see, I just used a basic web recorder, which is webcamera.io. And on there, as soon as you pull it up, you have the recording screen and you just hit the red square in the center to begin recording. I did have a external camera on my cam on my computer because I had had it for another project I had used. And I figured if I could have just a little better quality, that would be good. Otherwise, I did zero editing at all. I just downloaded the completed video and uploaded it to YouTube. Um, I did it in my dining room. I did it in my son's room. It was really anywhere that I could just have five minutes of peace away from my screaming children. Um, Nicole, do you want to hit the next one? Thank you. So then as time went on, I decided I was sick of seeing my face in all of these videos and I wanted them just to focus on the book. So I started using iMovie. This was a slight change, but I still found it really easy because I was just able to take pictures of the book and then save them all in an album on my phone and upload it straight to iMovie. And iMovie merged them all together in order and then I was able to record each page individually instead of the whole thing at a time. So this usually took me maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Um, Nicole is going to show you our first family literacy video, which was shot in my dining room um, very late at night. And it's a little rough, but they have come very far since then. Working from home on your studies, I figured you would still like some story times to share with your kids. So today I'm going to read you a book. It's called I'll Love You Till the Cows Come Home. It's by Catherine Cristaldi. So here is your story. I will love you till the cows come home from a trip to Mars through the skies unknown in a rocket ship made of glass and stone. I will love you till the cows come home. I and as you can see in these videos, it's like very hard to see the pictures. But when I moved to iMovie, they were able to see the pictures, they were able to see the words, and that will be this next video that Nicole is pulling up for you. You're going to read Leaf Trouble by Jonathan Emmett, illustrated by Caroline Jane Church. Okay, boys and girls, if anybody has a copy of Leaf Trouble at home, now is the time to go get it. You can just hit pause and then play when you're ready with your book. A fresh breeze blew across the woodland, tickling the tall grass and trembling the trees. Summer had left and autumn had arrived. Pip Squirrel stuck his head out of the nest and sniffed the air. <sniffs> Something's changed, he decided, and he scampered off to find out what it was. Okay, so as you can see in that one, it is a lot clearer. You can see all the words, and it gave the kids and the parents a chance to follow along with the words, actually, and not just try to trust my reading of the story. Okay, Nicole, you wanna show yours now? Sorry, I was on mute there. Um, this is my setup currently. I use my laptop, which has um, a camera, and I use a headset. I do recommend using a headset. Um, typically, I create a PowerPoint presentation first, and then I use Prezi Video where I can upload the PowerPoint to Prezi Video and then record through Prezi. And then the final step is downloading that video and then 
uploading that to YouTube. So there are a few steps involved, but they are fairly simple and straightforward. And once you do one or two, you kind of get the hang of it. Um, I have been doing a lot of citizenship videos. So I'm going to show a clip from my first video that I did on the N400 terms, which are the interview questions. Um, this really surprised me because today this video has more than 4,500 views. Um, so I was pleasantly surprised by that. And I will show you a clip from that in just a moment. Yes or no? Have you ever voted in any United States elections? Title of nobility. Title of nobility. Let's talk about title of nobility. This picture is Muhammad VI. Muhammad VI is the king of Morocco. He has a title of nobility. His title is king. His son is prince. Okay, so you can see in that video, um, I am using Prezi, and so you can alternate between seeing just you talking or just the slide or a combination of both. So that's one of the reasons I really like using Prezi. Um, and then I'll show you a later video that focuses on civics. We celebrate Independence Day on July 4th. When do we celebrate Independence Day? On July 4th. These are all the questions about the Declaration of Independence. Who wrote the Declaration of Independence? Thomas Jefferson. What did the Declaration of Independence do? Declared our independence. When was the Declaration of Independence adopted? July 4th, 1776. What are two rights in the Declaration of Independence? Life and liberty. Okay, so um, if you notice in that video, um, I was using Prezi and um, I was going back and forth between the slides and just me talking. Um, and I had a background behind me there where I actually have like a physical screen. Um, you can also do like a background that you would use on Zoom. So um, you can kind of customize whatever you have behind you and that can be a way that you can change kind of a production value of your videos. Okay and um, so we touched on you can use a computer with a webcam and a microphone. You can use a smartphone with video recording capability which is what we used on our first day of recording. Um, we do recommend a headset with a microphone. It makes the sound much better. And Sarah and I both use Prezi and PowerPoint. Sometimes I use Zoom to record. Caitlin 
first used webcamera.io and now uses iMovie. Okay, and now we'll talk a little about the use and benefits. So Sarah, can you take it away? Sure. So as we mentioned before, one of the big uh, uses is we found that we were able to offer this as asynchronous education. So these videos are on demand and available to students whenever they want to watch or review um, a particular topic. Um, we have also had a lot of success using them during live synchronous class time um, in some ways just to get the students familiar and realize that these videos are a resource to them that they can use more and also sometimes to review a particular topic in class. Uh, we've also used them uh, as a flipped classroom, sort of like I talked about before, where we can do some of our direct instruction and send it, the video to students prior to coming to class uh, online on Zoom. And then I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin to talk a little bit more about some of the other uses. So we have been using it for our families for at home story hour, which is our Isla or pack time that we typically have for family literacy. And so I have a Google classroom that is set up with it that the parents are able to watch a video and complete a craft also that goes along with it. I do get um, Chances to see completed worksheets crafts and such from our families and I have actually picked some of them back up from the families so we can still display in our office once we can open again. And Nicole, do you want to talk about the usage for citizenship. Sure, yeah. Um, so I teach several citizenship classes on Zoom, and so my students use it as repetition. Um, I go over reading and writing and they do homework, and they will take a picture of their writing sentences and text them to me. So that's one way I know that they're using them. Um, and also, since I launched the series of N400 videos, um, we've noticed a giant increase in viewers so like last in the last 28 days i think we've had 20,000 people view our videos and a lot of those are for the n400 preparation um so that's really taken off and um i know a lot of that's a really difficult part of the citizenship test so um we're really meeting a need and it's been exciting to see how many people are engaging with them and coming back and subscribing um, so I definitely can see the benefit of repetition for the students, um, hearing it slowly, being able to pause it, and then they, they add comments and ask questions, and I try to get back to their comments. And uh, we just kind of spoke to these benefits. Um, another benefit is an awareness of our program and our services. And we've actually had some students um, inquire about how they can sign up for classes after watching the videos. And now we'll turn it over to Sarah for some advice. Thanks, Nicole. So I would actually say my biggest advice is just to get curious and try it out a little for yourself. Um, as I mentioned before, I even myself was a little unsure about how easily we could do this. But as I started to explore some different things, I talked to Nicole and I talked to some of the other teachers who were making videos a lot. Um, I got really excited. And then once we actually started making them, the students really, really enjoyed being able to access the videos. Um, I don't know if any of us has said this yet, but I think for a lot of the students that we serve as well, it was just really nice to be able to have a connection and see their teachers as well and be able to access them in a virtual way uh, when it's we're not really getting to see much of each other anymore except for in, now in synchronous Zoom classes. Um, I think students really love seeing you on demand. I think once it's done, it's a really great resource to have the videos so folks can always be pointed back to them. If they missed a lesson, they, if they need extra practice on something, um, it really is actually a teacher time saver too, because often instead of having to sit one on one and explain what you did in class, you can refer someone back to a particular video. 
And I mean, last but not least, who doesn't want to be a star, even if it's just in your own classroom? I think that's been really a joy in doing this. Okay, and then for family literacy, I'd say just go for it. Um, they really aren't hard to do. And as Sarah said, our students are really benefiting from it, whether it's educational or enjoyment or getting to see our faces again. And I personally really enjoy making them. And I think a lot of the people, because we've gotten local celebrities, we've gotten community members and people that our students are familiar with to read books for us also. So I think that really helps. And it also is encouraging families to use the library now. They're asking us, how do we use the library? So I think all of these are great things for your students and you should just give it a try just a little bit before you dive off the deep end. Cool. Yeah, um, and yeah, I will echo Sarah and Caitlin's advice. Just try it and and see how it goes. Um, you can always improve on it later. Um, students just enjoy having access to the instruction that they're accustomed to. Um, and I've noticed um, that students are, you know, they're watching it again and again. And um, it's you are kind of a local celebrity. If I go and I substitute in another class and it's students I haven't met before, some of them recognize me and they're like, oh, I'm watching your videos. And so um, it's forming a new kind of online community and um, I'm enjoying that unexpected aspect of it. And I think we're turning it over to Todd. Great, thank you, you guys. This gives, uh, I, th I think, folks uh, a lot of ideas about how to use YouTube and more importantly, as you just kind of reiterated, um, kind of the courage or, or the desire to just go ahead and, and give it a shot, give it a try and, and see how you do. So I think that's great. Um, I wanted to start off with questions. Just, I know that, um, Caitlin, you kind of mentioned this, but uh, you guys have like really raised the um, awareness of Literacy Pittsburgh through these videos, both within the Pittsburgh community and um, outside of your uh, um, area. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Um, Caitlin, some of the people you've got, uh, gotten involved in uh, reading the books and just kind of your broader audience? Absolutely. Um, so we have definitely had a lot of people offer to read books. Um, locally, we have three sports teams and out of those three, two of them, we've had players actually volunteer to read books. So we had the center from the Pittsburgh Steelers, Stephen Wisniewski. We've had two of the Pittsburgh Pirates players contribute books, um, both their catcher and their pitcher. We've had Pennsylvania's second lady, Giselle Fetterman, read for us. We've had local um, news celebrities, radio celebrities. We've had the editor from the food and travel section of the Wall Street Journal read for us. We've had a lot of different people and it's not just necessarily local Pittsburgh people anymore. The other thing is we're reaching, as Nicole said, people outside of Pittsburgh. Um, we can track our views, so we are able to see if they're in Pittsburgh, if they're in the state, if they're out of the state, and we've definitely seen views coming in from other countries, and it has triggered people sending us requests saying, can we get classes through you also? Oh, wow. So you're actually getting enrollment um, from folks outside of the Pittsburgh area. Yeah, that actually happened Wednesday. I got three requests um, from people out of the country and four from out of our state. We unfortunately do only serve people in Allegheny and Beaver counties. So I was able to redirect them to local literacy councils and agencies near them. But we are getting requests from other people and out of state now. Perfect. I actually have a question. I was reading the Q&A. People have entered their questions there. And I want to ask you, one of the questions is like, how do students have an opportunity to make questions, you know, ask questions or make comments on your videos? 
So um, there is an option on YouTube to make a comment and they click on it and, and type a comment. So um, that's one way. And then um, if it is our actual students that are commenting, um, they can ask in class or sometimes they'll send me a text message or an email or even a WhatsApp message and ask me questions about the videos. Yeah, I have the same experience. This is Sarah. I have the same experience as Nicole as often students will either leave a little message on the video or um, they'll also reach out to me via text or email or even in class if they're coming to um, online class. Yes, and it's Caitlin again. I have the same experience that Sarah and Nicole. I also, since my story time videos are linked to our Google Classroom, I do get comments there also or when I see students for drop off, drop off and pick up of materials that we're using. Great, thank you. Great, we have a lot of questions about copyright, um, about the copyright, especially of reading the uh, children's books on YouTube. Um, what, have you guys thought about the copyright uh, issues? Have you done any investigation and I'll, I, like to add to whatever you kind of respond to that? Um, we have, this is actually a big concern of mine. I recorded, I think 15 videos the first day and then I was like, wait, can I actually put these up? Um, so our communications director did a lot of research and she felt that it was safe enough for us to put it up because at that time we were just using it for private interagency story times, even though it was on YouTube. Um, but we also aren't making any profit off of this at all. And so she said just to go for it. And the worst thing that might happen is our YouTube channel will get taken down for our story times. And um, as far as the photos that we use on Prezi, um, we do searches and make sure that the photos have a Creative Commons license so that they are um, able to be used. We don't use photos that you need to purchase or that have copyright restrictions. Great, thank you. And I will just let folks know, I posted an article a little bit earlier and I'm posting it again in the chat room. It's from a uh, librarian who is a uh, copyright expert from the ALA uh, talking about uh, using uh, books in story time in libraries and then uh, transferring that to fair use for uh, an online environment. I think it's a really good discussion uh, to kind of give you some guidance and, and things to consider. And a lot of it is kind of what Caitlin said about not making a profit off of it and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing that we've talked about just more broadly in some of our presentations is uh, just as a general rule of, you know, if you're displaying something to make it, uh, we've talked about this with digitizing uh, student resources or student materials and uh, kind of the, the basic guiding principle is if you are copying something to make it easier to use, you're typically okay if you're copying something so that you uh, don't have to buy it, then you're typically not okay. So another example of that would be if I'm teaching from a, a set of instructional materials and I'm the teacher and I already have that book, if I wanna scan that in so that I can display it in a Zoom meeting, and then I've sent that student book to all of the students who are on the Zoom meeting, I'm just scanning that in so it's easier for me to display and I don't have to hold it up like Caitlin did when she was uh, reading the student book. However, if I scan that book in and show it on Zoom and then attach that digitized copy as a PDF to an email and send it out to all my students so that they don't have to buy the book, then that's clearly a copyright violation. So just kind of keep that keep that in mind as, as it's just kind of another um, good guiding principle. But I think this article can, um, uh, can help you a lot with, with that. Um, so, all right, Patty, do you have another question? I'm gonna kind of close out these copyright questions. 
Yes, Todd, thank you. Um, there is another question about the preference of why, or maybe I think you already covered it, but if you could just repeat, um, what are the advantages of using Prezi versus PowerPoint or Prezi over Zoom recordings and the other um, software use? What would you prefer Prezi over those two? This one, and Nicole, if you want to add in anything, um, this is Sarah speaking. Um, with Prezi, so otherwise you would either have to use PowerPoint within a Zoom or within Prezi because those are both um, formats in which you can record. I'm, I'm not aware actually of something within PowerPoint itself where you can record a video. Um, I personally like Prezi because of the way it displays that Nicole kind of talked a little bit about where you can have just an image of yourself talking. You can then bring in images from a PowerPoint um, a little bit smaller on the right hand side of the video, or you can go full screen with whatever the images you're using in a PowerPoint deck as well. And you can kind of toggle between all three of those. So kind of having those different uh, abilities is really nice. Um, you're also able, I believe, and Nicole, I think you've done this with some of your citizenship videos, to record within Zoom uh, with Prezi as well. And I think Nicole, I'm going to hand it over to Nicole to talk more about this, but I think, Nicole, you've done this when you've had more than one person remotely in a video together along with an image. Yeah, that's correct. So um, you can connect Zoom and Prezi together and you, you kind of set it up as a live conference, even if you're not really having a conference. Um, but we do record some videos where I'm doing a practice interview with another teacher and, um, and you can see both people and you can see the slides. So um, it's, it's another way that you can combine the two of them. Um, but as Sarah said, I also prefer the way that Prezi works because of the fact that you can show just you, you in a slide or just the slide and it's um, a nice, easy to use format. Um, so uh, if that helps, that's my answer as well. Great. Um, so I think um, you've, you've been very encouraging for folks who uh, may have been questioning, can I shoot a video? But we have another question uh, that is the other aspect of it is, um, how do you start a YouTube channel? Is that a complicated process? Um, our PR person started the channel. It's not complicated. I just, I don't have a, a direct answer for that. Okay, uh, great. I'll, I'll respond to that. And um, it's just saying, no, I started one for my daughter so she could share her gaming recordings uh, with her friends. And um, I think I started it by just Googling, how do I start a YouTube channel <laughs> and found some step-by-step -step, uh, directions that were really easy to follow. So I would encourage you uh, to just kind of take that approach and give it a shot. Patty, you ready with the next one? I'm ready with the next one. So they want to know, um, how do you supply your craft materials for your family liter literacy programs? Um, so that is 100% on me. I actually bag them all up and drive them to every student's house. Um, so when we're doing these programmings, with them, if they're materials that I haven't already provided them, they will get a bag of materials for their craft projects. Um, typically, I would already have this all preset out for them in the classroom, but since we aren't in the classroom, I am driving to roughly 35 to 40 families' houses. That answers the question. Thank you so much. Great. And um, another question we have is, uh, rather than reinventing the wheel, how can other literacy programs utilize what you and others have already uh, created? And just as part of the response to that, I posted the uh, links to the two uh, Literacy Pittsburgh uh, YouTube channels, the Family Literacy one and the English class. Uh, so talk about like how you think other programs might be able to use what you guys have done. 
Sure. Um, so for our um, ELL instruction site, um, our, our channel, we have um, playlists and we've organized some of the playlists by level. So we have um, foundations level, level one, two, three, and four. Um, and so if you have like a general sense of the level that you want to use, you could refer students to one of our playlists. Um, you could create your own playlist of videos that you find from all over the web that you want your students to see. And that way you're just sharing. Um, I do that as well. I, I have other channels that I like the videos and I, I like how they were taught. And so I will share from other sources as well. Great, great, thank you. I would add to that too, like a lot of the videos that Nicole has created specifically around citizenship, um, those are widely, I would say widely usable because most folks are teaching to the test and so they'll be using the exact same materials. And I think that's why you've seen such a big jump in the number of folks viewing those videos because they're filling an additional kind of study gap in addition to some of the booklets and the tapes and stuff that are already out there in existence around citizenship materials. Great, great point. Yes, I actually wanted to um, cover a question that they asked about if you have used clo closed captioning or subtitles for viewers or for your students who are hard of hearing. We have not done that yet. Um, it is a great question and it's something that um, I would like to do. Um, just haven't, um, we're really limited staff and so I um, haven't had a, ch a chance to transcribe all of the videos, but it's something that I've thought about and hopefully we can do in the future. Um, I think actually a lot of the videos as you uh, upload them to YouTube now, they're automatically by an AI done. And I think for the most part, so I've actually watched this and see, watched to see like how our videos were captioned. They're generally very accurate. I think some of that is because we're speaking extremely slowly and enunciating super well that it's very easy for the AI to pick up on it. But I believe a lot of the videos that are automatically uploaded to YouTube now um, automatically get that closed captioning. So it, it is already there on most of the videos. That's correct, Sarah. It, YouTube does automatically do that. You can also, when you upload a video, there's a setting when you're uploading it that can allow other people to add closed captioning as well. So it may do closed captioning in English, but if people want to add a translation in another language or things like that, you can allow uh, people to create their own closed captioning and, and upload that as well. Um, I have a question, but before I ask it, I just want to point out that we are uh, getting close to the um, uh, top of the hour when our webinar is going to be over. And um, Caitlin and Nicole and Sarah have graciously agreed to kind of stick around past the end of the webinar to make sure that everybody's questions get answered. Um, but um, so I want to encourage people, if you do have a question, uh, please get that question in because we will stop kind of taking questions at the top of the hour. Um, thank everyone for uh, uh, coming and you're welcome to stick around and hear the answers to the questions uh, past the top of the hour uh, if you'd like to do that. Uh, we do have uh, some uh, promo slides for upcoming webinars. Can I get uh, Nicole to stop sharing your screen and uh, Victoria, can you share our kind of wrap up slides so people can get that information and then we'll go back to Nicole. Great. Todd, do you want to make these announcements or would you sure. like me to? Absolutely. I'll do it. And uh, so as uh, Jen mentioned earlier, we were uh, kind of doing these on the fourth uh, Friday of every month. We have holidays coming up. So we decided to combine the November and December ones into uh, one webinar. So that webinar, our next webinar is going to be on Friday, 
December 4th at 1 p.m. Eastern. We don't have a topic yet, but we're working on it. And um, so kind of keep uh, uh, visit uh, EdTech or Pro Literacy to find out what that topic is. We'll let you know as soon as we have it. Uh, upcoming webinars from Pro Literacy. You can go to proliteracy.org slash webinars and you can see our uh, upcoming schedule. This includes our own ideas from the field webinars, webinars from New Readers Press and our membership webinars. You can also find recordings of these distance education uh, strategies and solutions webinars as well as our other ones uh, on that same page. And Victoria, I'll let you talk about uh, what's coming up from the EdTech Center. Great, thanks Todd. Um, and, and thank you to our presenters, that was awesome. Um, so today, actually, uh, if you're not doing anything um, at the hour now, please join us for another webinar on readability and digital text. Uh, I will um, chat that link before I head off to that one. Uh, we are also on the second Friday of every month hosting uh, distance ed strategy sessions, um, and you can register for that on our website. Uh, we also have a new self-paced and free uh, transforming distance education course that is also on our website. If you just go to our homepage, uh, you'll see it in, in the top navigation or um, of the what's new on, on the front page. So that's it from me. Thanks so much, everyone. Great. Great, and we'll go back to Nicole's slide if you don't mind. And um, Nicole, you can put that information back up. And again, kind of thank everybody for, for coming and we'll get back to answering questions. Okay, uh, so folks from uh, Literacy Pittsburgh, we have uh, uh, two questions here and they kind of go together. So the first one is an administrative uh, question. Well, they both are. Uh, so the first one is, have you found a way to count and report hours for students who are watching the YouTube videos? So um, we can record hours if we can prove that they have watched the video. So one way that I do this with the citizenship videos is I give the students a task to do, such as write um, five sentences and text them to me. And if they do that, then I know that they watch the whole video because it's at the end. And so then I can count the amount of time they watch the video plus like 10 minutes for doing the writing. And um, it's not under like our PA education grant hours, but we can record it under this other hours thing. And um, we record it as like YouTube live time or something like that. Um, and so um, I don't know exactly like, I'm not an admin, so I'm not exactly sure who cares about those particular hours, but that's one way that we can count them. Um, Pennsylvania does not currently have uh, YouTube viewing hours as an acceptable um, report. Let me back on that a little bit, Nicole. So this is Sarah. Um, part of, yeah, right now it's not one of the approved list of distance learning that folks can do. So right now I think there's a set of um, mostly paid for, but a few not paid for distance learning things that we can count direct instruction hours for. And we can count hours for um, online Zoom classes in Pennsylvania. Um, I think so we are recording in-house at our agency these additional hours and kind of counting them, like Nicole said, either YouTube viewing or like remote assignment, counting them as that kind of a thing if we know for sure that a student was able to view the videos. And I think the thinking down the line is that we're recording all this and we're going to share this information with the state to try to advocate potentially in the future to be able to count those hours. But there's just not really a a mechanism for that right now. I think a lot of states are kind of experiencing this sort of like wild west experience of like what can be counted now that a lot of programs have had to shift to online learning. And I, it's Caitlin, I can speak to this as an admin. Um, Sarah is spot on that we are tracking this so we can share it with the Department of Education in Pennsylvania because Currently, everything is under review and we are able to submit the different things that we are doing 
so they can take into account how many people are using this, what kind of results we are getting from it. And so if we don't track the time based off of activities like Nicole has provided or I have through my Google Classroom, we don't have the solid evidence to track it. So it's, it is helpful for our organization and hopefully in the end for the state to make a decision on whether or not we can officially count these hours. Great, and one more kind of uh, part two of that admin question is with the uh, YouTube videos being part of your overall educational services, um, are your synchronous class hours reduced at all? So are you doing, I, I think they would be reduced by maybe uh, having kind of flipped learning things. So if students are learning some content outside of the class, has that reduced your uh, workload for uh, um, kind of the in-person synchronous Zoom meetings or WhatsApp meetings or however else you're working with students? Sarah, this is Sarah again. I can address this a little bit. I mean, I think it's really a matter of like when you speak to the flipped learning aspect, like freeing up time in class. So it's not like they cut into any of the time that we have. And if anything, like being able to refer to the videos and send them to students um, outside of class or before class time, it gives them an opportunity then having had viewed that to really just use the synchronous class time we have to practice or apply or do some kind of activity based on what they were instructed on or what they learned about in the videos. So it hasn't, it hasn't necessarily cut the synchronous class time down, but it's made it be used differently. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good way of thinking about it. And it's opened up, I think one of the big challenges, at least I personally have been kind of negotiating is like, how do I get students to interact with each other more online in online classes? And by kind of removing the time needed to do a lot of direct instruction, that frees up more time in our scheduled Zoom class times to be able to think through and have students interact with each other and speak more. Okay, great, great. Patty, I think you're up next. Thank you. I was just answering some questions in the Q&A. <laughs> but I assume that each one of you um, manage your own YouTube channel or your own videos, or is there a certain a central point of contact who will be checking all the channels and be um, managing those. Any answer to that question? Um, this is Nicole. So we have like a handful of people that are admins on our YouTube channel. So any of those people can see comments um, and respond to them. Um, we don't have any official things set up as far as that. I think we just like if someone sees it, we respond to it at this time. Awesome, that's great. And also just the kind of another question, um, do you promote the YouTube channels at all or the programs or is that just specifically for your own students that you let them know where they're available? Um, it, mostly we're just, texting students that are in our classes like hey watch this video um, although we do have like um, when you make a YouTube video you can you can add what's called an end screen and on that end screen you can you can ask people to subscribe to your channel or you can also link it to another video so in that way it's kind of like an embedded um, promotion so that if someone watches it then they see that then they can subscribe um, but we're not doing anything outside of that as far as I know um, to promote our channel. All right. Thank you. Let me ask the next question, Todd. <laughs> sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, one of the questions is, have you used Edpuzzle or something similar to add self-study quizzing on the YouTube videos? And if so, did, did you see any improvement on the student learning results? Um, I, this is Nicole, so I haven't used Edpuzzle. Um, a lot of my students are very low level ELL students. And so the biggest reason we chose YouTube was because it's so easy to use and it wasn't something that we would have to teach from a distance. 
um, we find that teaching um, digital literacy is a challenge for this group of students and especially teaching digital literacy while we're distance learning is an even bigger challenge. It's something that we're working on, but um, for the lower level ELL students, we try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, however, for some of my students, I have linked um, surveys and or Quizlet sets that are in a comment below the video so that students can further their learning or take a quiz. Um, and I don't know, Sarah and Caitlin, if, if you've used any of those sort of programs before, you can speak to that. Sure, I can, this is Sarah, I can piggyback on that a little. I've gone even lower tech and oftentimes like in terms of like checking, did they watch the video? Uh, what did they retain from the video? I have and sometimes just in synchronous class ask questions specifically about the video and quiz them kind of verbally that way. And then I know that we've also sent some packets out through the mail that practice some of the things that are in the video. But um, I think that this is a particularly good area to try to think about how could we incorporate this more. And as Nicole said, we're like trying to figure out it in such a way that the navigating the online and different kind of digital literacies that are necessary to access the assessment uh, don't get in the way of um, being able to accurately assess like what um, what of the content the students actually understand. But I think that's a great idea. Great. And I have one more kind of follow up question to the um, that kind of marketing aspect. So it sounds like you are just primarily marketing, like you're just marketing this to your students, sending them out the links to the channel or the individual videos. And you're not really, like you don't have a marketing effort outside of that. So I guess my question is twofold. One, when you're setting up the videos, are you making them uh, publicly available so people could find them if they're, you know, searching and they show up by the video descriptions. Um, and then the second is, how are those people outside of your community or outside of your program even finding them if you're getting these people from, you know, other states and other countries? So yeah, I can answer that. Yes, um, they are publicly available. Um, and um, when you're when you have a channel, you can kind of load keywords so that when people are searching certain things, they can find the videos more easily. So for example, like literacy Pittsburgh would be one of our keywords. If someone's searching that, our videos will come up. Or, um, and then in addition to that, um, on each video, you can, you can put like keywords on it. So, I'll put like, if it's a citizenship video, citizenship, N400, and then maybe even like the particular question that it is. Um, and so those are simple ways where the videos can become um, better, uh, more easily searchable. Um, and then um, YouTube just automatically started recommending some of the videos. So maybe because of those keywords, but um, like for example, the N400 videos, um, YouTube just automatically recommends that to people that are watching other N400 videos. And so I'm not exactly sure how YouTube does that. Um, it just started doing it. And it, that's kind of what made it exponentially um, grow in how many views that we had. Great, and it does that because you set them up as being publicly available. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. All right. I think that is all of our questions. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone for uh, coming and, and attending. Uh, great crowd and some great questions. Thank you, Nicole, Caitlin, and Sarah for uh, being so generous of your uh, time today and sharing what you've uh, learned about creating YouTube videos. Hopefully a lot of us are going to go back and um, um, try our luck. So
Great. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. you everyone, uh, have a great uh, rest of your day. Have a great weekend. And uh, hopefully we'll see you on uh, December 4th. All right. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.